and welcome to Dialogue. This year marks the 45th anniversary of China's reform and opening up policy. Thanks to the enforcement of such a policy, China has become the world's second largest economy or the largest by purchasing power parity from an economic backwater. It's a major trade partner for more than 140 countries and regions and contributes some 30% to global economic growth. What does it exactly mean when we talk about reform and opening up? What experiences can be learned? And what challenges does China face to maintain the positive momentum? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined by Artu Dalakoti, Executive Director of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, Wang Dan, Chief Economist at Hansen Bank in China, and David Mahong, Executive Chairman of Mahong China Investment Management. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingduo. Welcome to Dialogue. If you look back at the past 45 years, uh, Wang Dan, I will start with you. you know, how do you characterize China's journey of development? Uh, the past 45 years was indeed a roller coaster for China's opening up reform. In every period, China was facing a new problem and it was trying to find new solutions and usually a successful one in a relatively short period of time. And we saw in the 1980s, it was mostly the rural reform. Uh, so China was liberating farms from just doing agriculture so they can do migrant works and other types of more uh, higher income works. And then in the 90s, there were major reforms in the fiscal uh, decentralization. There was a commercial housing market set up and there was the SOE reform. And when we entered the 2000s, there was the WTO accession. And China since then has entered this new phase of entering the global market. And it seems that the global market was infinite. A lot of the wealth was created in the past uh, 20 years. And now we're into this new phase. And there are new challenges, such as uh, how do we implement the next phase of the reform? How do we cope with the geopolitical tensions? So we're dealing with new problems, and China is still feeding the stones after all those years. OK. Uh, so David, so China, you know, probably one of the challenges, characteristics of the reform and opening up process is really about, you know, uh, crossing the river by feeding the stone. So we are still feeding the stone. Do you agree? I don't think we are. I think the river's now being crossed and recrossed. There are bridges over it, high speed trains pass it. Okay. It's a very different country. Uh, this is almost exactly 40 years since I first came to live in Beijing. So the reform years have been the continuity of my time here. And I think back to the 1980s when China was backward in so many ways. It was backward technologically, it was backward socially in terms of not being connected interconnected china was a very sort of parts of china were isolated from the other it has become a very different country but the thing it never was was backward in an intellectual sense in a human sense even in the health sense china was an educated healthy country with not a lot of money and not a lot of business opportunities so the reforms have been important but really what's happened is people have come to discover the potential that was always there. It's like watching someone become themselves. That's been my experience. So it's been very exciting. And I think we're still in the era of Deng Xiaoping's reforms. The momentum is still there. Mm, the momentum is still there. Uh, so uh, Mr. Dalakoti, so what's your experience? What's your observation of the past 45 years? Well, I have uh, also been staying in China for a very long time. It's going to be my 40, I'm going to complete 46 years. And uh, uh, there's a tremendous change which has happened in China. You know, from 1986, I've been doing business in China. There's no doubt in my mind that the policy of uh, these special economic zones, which was the basis of the reform and the opening policy of China created pockets of excellence and wealth and spearheaded the whole modernization of the Chinese economy. My first businesses were concentrated in these SEZs, which were mostly in southern China. 
fast forward to today i am work, working with the chinese state owned companies like china genetic and we have formed a joint venture in the hainan free trade port which is truly a game changer with more open policies included including visa free access to most of the countries in the world to hainan and state of the art infrastructure uh great tax policies uh, we'll see hainan free trade port will become a center for not only chinese talent but also international talent would find it very attractive mm -hmm. one time uh, if you look at the reform and opening up you know uh, of course you know we have been talking about this for decades uh, but for for china it's really about opening up this country uh, to provide this land and this opportunities uh, uh, to uh, investors from other places of the world and for people they may find okay this is uh, there are um, opportunities for investment so it's a, also a process of integration with the rest of the world i mean what what does it exactly mean uh, reform and opening up you know, to reform what and opening up you know the country in what which sector and to what a degree when we talk about opening up uh, to the rest of the world, there's always uh, definitions that differ um, from period to period. And so when we talk about opening up in the 1980s, it was mostly about uh, accepting the rules of the global trade. And China was trying to establish its industrial structure and uh, provide the goods that the global market needs. But now when we're talking about uh, opening up, it's more about allowing or encouraging mostly encouraging foreign investors to come to China. So it's no longer the case that China is making money from the rest of the world. It is that we also open up the domestic market so that the rest of the world can find opportunities here. So it's an entirely different scenario now. And that depends on the development stage of China. And in the next 45 years, there's going to be more challenges because now we're entering this digital age. And opening up means something entirely different. So we're talking about data, privacy, uh, how do we do business with a lot of the digital deliverables across the border of different countries. And we can also see this new trend of a sort of regionalization rather than globalization. So the narratives are also different. In this deep transition, China is taking a very different role as well. Previously, it was mostly a follower, but now China is more and more to the front line and making the rules along with other industrial economies. Mm -hmm. uh, well said. Uh, so, David, uh, obviously the content uh, for reform and opening up uh, differs from uh, time to time, from different decades, let's say, and also probably China's role, uh, you know, playing by the government is also changing, uh, by the country is also changing, if you compare that with uh, the global economy. Uh, is that the case, do you think so? That's a very good point. Uh, most foreigners look at China's government, the Communist Party, as being static. The thing that people took a picture of in the 80s, early 90s. And they hold it very firmly as a definition of the political culture of China. Whereas I think all of us have observed both the Chinese government and the Communist Party have been immensely flexible and have, have changed and adapted over the last four decades, which is why China is a, not just a, an organically dynamic economy, it is, and this is something that certainly the Anglophone media don't recognize, it's a changing political and administrative system all the time. So it's a very different country um in terms of the way that the economy is led the government intervenes still in a way that governments don't intervene in the west but then we haven't had a recession in china or an economic collapse since reform began there's been slower periods of growth but there's been no major collapse whereas in the west i think there's been 50 major economic crashes recessions um, since the second world war so I think we're looking at a country where the government's involvement means that there's a great deal of stability in areas where there's often instability in other economies. On the one hand, on the other hand, in some parts of the economy, things move too slowly because the government is so heavily involved. And one of those is the financial sector, capital markets, a non-state banking sector. 
would still need to be better structured to counterbalance the state sector. But the role of the state has lifted, you hear 400 million, 500 million people out of poverty. And we do business a lot in remote rural areas, places I've been going back to and back to over decades. And you can see the development and change. You can see that even a, a, a province like Guizhou, there is no county left that is any longer defined as being in poverty. So, in effect, what the government's managed to do is blend socialism and some principles with a free market energy, and that's unique. It doesn't really have an equivalent globally. So, Mr. Dalakoti, uh, I wonder if you agree with uh, with David. Obviously, you see like there's a like a mixed practice of uh, you know uh, free market, but also you see visible hand of the government uh, here in China. So it's a it's a unique case uh, in a sense. That's true. Uh, I think China is a very unique case. And, uh, you know, the whole amazing policy of opening up economic reforms in the past 45 years have uh, basically made China into the second largest economy. There's no doubt about this fact. And I salute China for bringing, I think, about 770 million people uh, out of absolute poverty. In these decades, China has also become an important part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and has achieved significant progress in eradicating poverty in all of its forms, which is truly a leading challenge for the Global South. China's achievements provide valuable lessons in poverty elevation uh, to the whole world. Coming back to the policies, I think you know, China is a continent-sized country. It's a huge country. So we need to see it from that point of view. And as we move forward, the economic uh, policies will become more and more difficult because, you know, 45 years back, China had a per capita of a few hundred dollars. And today it is uh, about more than 12,000 US dollars. So we'll see a lot of uh, opportunities in sectors and with the whole international situation, which today is becoming quite uh, different from in the past, China will have to really keep a very close watch on its policies and try to bring it at speed with what is happening in the world. So today China is part of the big world economy. China is one of the biggest exporters. It's also one of the biggest importers. So from that point of view, I think it is very important that the Chinese policy going forward is a policy which benefits the people. Uh, that's also probably uh, part of the Chinese characteristics, uh, if I may say, uh, one day. You know, China, for example, stresses very much about you know common prosperity. Of course, not equally uh, everybody is prosperous as like Jack Ma, but uh, but the the idea is very clear. That is, you know, elimination of the absolute poverty. You know, people get a decent living standard. Um, but if you uh, if you let me say a government and a, a market economy or absolute market economy. I mean, uh, the gap uh, between the wealth and the, uh, the have-nots is absolute. I mean, it's natural. People will view it that natural. But here you do see an active role by the government to narrow the gap, to um, basically uh, lift the power of people out of poverty and also to pursue, I mean, as a goal, uh, the common prosperity. That's also part of the, that's the, the characteristics of the Chinese practice here? Across the world, it doesn't matter uh, what kind of ideology a country follows, or whether it's an industrial country or a very small developing country, their goal is to create a more equal and a more prosperous society. That's, that's common across, across different continents. But in China's case, it's quite difficult in many senses. To start with, we have the largest, we have been having the largest population in the world. Until this year, of course, uh, India overtook China as the number one populous country in the world. But for China, um, just imagine the difficulty of lifting millions of people out of poverty. And now we're trying to create a more equal society. 
And the biggest inequality in China is not in income, but in terms of wealth. And most of the wealth have been concentrated in housing. So starting around 2016, Chinese government was trying to implement this housing reform, trying to say that we shouldn't encourage speculation in the housing market anymore. So now this battle seemed to reach a critical point because housing prices are permanently down from before. But the next phase uh, will be even more challenging because we need to find alternatives for people to grow their wealth. Um, and to create a more equal society is not a easy task for any government. And China is trying to accommodate a different group of people while prioritizing the lower income families. And it has become um, actually a more uh, inclusive growth model, I would say, over time. Mm -hmm. uh, are we talking about uh, probably unprecedented challenges here for, for China, uh, like the housing market here? Uh, Wang Dan, you know, previously at least we can say, I think we all agree that is if you look at the style or the characteristics of the Chinese um, uh, approach, that is mostly people would say gradual or you know, experimental, you know, you have a, a free economic zone. Uh, if it uh, works and then you expand the practice to the rest of the country, uh, but now it increasingly, uh, I mean, the new challenges are simpler, like a bigger problem, like a property market. Uh, is that still possible to have an experiment like in one city and then if it succeeds, we can copy it uh, in other cities? Uh, Chinese government never believed shock therapy. And when we look at the experience from other developing countries, whoever adopted shock therapy usually ended up in disaster because it wouldn't be a vacuum. Someone's going to take up that institutional vacuum, and usually that someone is not the best one with the best economic agenda. So for China, even when it comes to the critical issue and more urgent issue like uh, uh, the ho household registration reform or the housing reform, we're still more or less doing this um, pilot scheme to start with and then try to see whether it can be extended nationwide. So the phase has always been controlled. And it has a lot of merits, but along the way, we can see that it creates different challenges since we have huge regional disparity. Um, but I would still argue that it is more beneficial for China to have this kind of experimental mentality uh, just to see whether something works. If it doesn't, then we, then we move back. That's the flexibility of the system. Uh, we don't have different parties to debate whether a policy uh, should be implemented or not. And usually there's quite good policy consistency between different governments. And for central government, they would like the implementation of their policies to be at a proper amount. But we know that the local government is usually an amplifier for whatever the central government wants to do. So an incremental approach is always the better choice. Mm -hmm. uh, David, so, well, we maybe uh, uh, have finished the stage of... Uh, crossing the river by feeding uh, the stones, uh, maybe we are on the high speed rail. Uh, so still experimental, uh, that's a gradual approach is the preferred. I think so. I think Wang Dan's described it very well, uh, that in principle on the big things, one needs to move carefully to keep reevaluating how effective it is. And yes, there aren't competing political parties, but the centre has to talk to every province. It has to negotiate. It has to compromise. There's a very um, interactive process around whether or not policy is effective or not. But overall, China is actually travelling pretty well. I mean, this year we're going to get an excess of 5% GDP growth. So if you look at um, the only other country that's growing faster than China is India, but off a lower base. Next year, China will also be the second largest economy in terms of GDP growth in the world. Then you look at the last three years, China accumulatively has gained 20% in GDP terms. It's 7.7% in America and 3% in Europe. So the energy and momentum, despite the problems, is there for the country to tap into. And I think they will look to other sectors to find engines that used to be provided from the property sector. 
So I'm relatively optimistic. My biggest concern is our global political relationships, that America is determined to curtail China and Europe is falling into that um, strategy as well. And for all the good words from the recent visit of the Australian Prime Minister, it is still the situation that it's, let's stop China growing. I mean, forget human rights, forget Taiwan, whatever the arguments are, they're just excuses. America doesn't want to see China emerge. That's a problem. It won't stop us, but it is a problem and one that I think will influence business and is going to be a major preoccupation for um, the central government. But we'll, we'll get through it. It just make a difficult few years ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Mr. Dalakoti, obviously the new challenges, you know, something beyond China's uh, control, let's say geopolitics, for example, the U.S. Uh, efforts to contain the rise of China, the development of China, and of course with uh, uh, their, their allies like in Europe and Asia, they, they are creating a new set of challenges for the Chinese government. Uh, um, it, it will probably will take some time to deal with that. Oh. You know, what I really would like to do is to first go back and say that, you know, the, uh, China was a state-controlled market when it started the whole process of opening up and reform. And uh, as you rightly said, crossing the river by feeling the stones, it describes aptly China's initial reform processes. But as the process of opening up gathered pace, the Chinese leadership realized its transformational impact and became much more bolder in its reforms. The infrastructure investments were linked very closely with the property boom and fed on each other. This led to China creating a marvel of infrastructure development, which has never been achieved in any country in such a short time. But going forward, you know, not only looking at the uh, global situations of what uh, the situation in Ukraine is what is in uh, the conflict between Hamas and Hamas and um, Israel, or the uh, U.S. policy towards China. Going forward, China and the other countries, especially India included, need to work on the information infrastructure so that we can try to bridge the digital divide which exists with the Western world. We need to have a digital integration to create seamless process of intelligent manufacturing. We need digital agriculture, digital retail, digital healthcare, digital logistics, and a digital mindset of doing businesses. This is what the next 45 years of Chinese opening up and reform should concentrate upon. If we truly believe in globalization and the shared prosperity, we are obliged to work together to create this ecosystem for our future generations. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, one thing, you know, China has just uh, concluded uh, its annual uh, Central Economic Conference, you know, which usually uh, sets agenda for its economic policy and outline its uh, practices for next year. Uh, so what's your takeaway? What are the priorities, in your opinion, uh, should China's next stage of reform and opening up focus on? Well, this year's Central Work Economics, uh, Central Economic Board Conference focuses on mainly three things. One is development, and that focuses on high quality growth rather than just growth itself. And number two is reform, and that will be a continuation of the previous reform on the SOEs and housing market. And number three is economic security. And comparing to the previous years of Central Economic Work Conference, this year's stress of economic security is unprecedented. And we can see that just when it comes to the supply chain security, the central government has spent a tremendous amount of resources trying to shore up innovation capacity on supporting private and state-owned enterprises in their innovation capacity. And this is quite critical for China's next phase of economic transition. And there are pressures from domestic development because we need to create new markets for whatever overcapacity we have in the industries. Uh, China also needs to explore overseas market. Given that the U.S. export control will remain there, uh, we might see more competition between U.S. and China in the years to come. So the competition for other markets will only intensify. And this year's World Conference stressed that we need to maintain the financial and economic stability 
in order to shore up security. And that is quite key when it comes to the investment decisions for domestic and foreign investors. Uh, so lastly, uh, David, I mean, look ahead uh, for you know next five, 45 years or next decade in terms of reform and opening up. Some people would say you know the way to deal with the competition or the uh, containment policy from Washington is really about to continue to open and embrace the globalization, embrace the rest of the world. Uh, do you think that's the case? You know, as uh, uh, said by Mr. Delacote. I think I think that's exactly it. Absolutely. Um, China could try and close itself off. A lot of countries around the world are doing that, um, not just post-pandemic, but also there's been a sense in the West that they lost something um, as the, the global South, as the developing world gained so much in the last four decades, not just from China's rise, but you look at across Asia, Indonesia, India particularly, the rise of all these nations have created commonwealth, unprecedented commonwealth. But many in the West think that they've lost something in order for this gain to have occurred, which isn't true. And China's resistance to closing itself off, the fact that it's really making strides to be more open, and you can see that in the diplomatic arena. I mean, the detente of the last few months is impressive. I would hope, though, that the most important relationship actually is India. China needs to resolve any tensions with India and find a real partnership, the two most populous countries, both innovative countries, creative, intelligent countries, the ability for those two countries to make a big difference and to lead to a more stable world is a good one. I fear, though, that we're going to face some real challenges. I don't think America will give up trying to contain China. That might even have military ramifications not over Taiwan, but somewhere else in Asia, perhaps. Some proxy conflict is possible. But even, even then, because China is not seeking conflict itself, as long as it keeps building its domestic economy to make it stronger, to make it more inclusive, to make it more open, particularly in its free market, then foreign companies will come and invest here. People will come and try and sell products here. And so over time, I think that, that principle um, is one that's going to mean that China will move ahead steadily and the rest of the world will benefit. But if China falls into the trap of, of conflict and real, a real standoff, particularly with America, then I think a lot of things are at great risk globally. I don't see the instinct for that at the moment. Well, on that note, we come to the end for today's discussion. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Xinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.